So uh, stand with me, go to Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2, it'll be brief. Uh, if you can listen fast, I'll talk fast and we'll get through it fast, all right? Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter number 2. Now, I know this. Uh, I don't know um, Portuguese fluently, but um, I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. And I... I I, mean, I, I could dig it there. I can dig it. I like those people. I like those people. I, I, I hope someday uh, this year uh, I'm taking Ariana to uh, South Africa for her mission trip. Uh, those that have given to that, thank you for that. It's a real blessing to her. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing what Brother Mike Flick, one of our missionaries, is doing on the mission field. And uh, he's always busy. And uh, my, my other daughter, Isabella, says, I want to go to Brazil for my mission trip. So... Hopefully here in a few years, brother, we'll see you down there. That'd be the goal. And I'll mess everything up that you've been working on so hard to make good there, okay? Uh, I'll mess up all the language. I'll, I, I'll do my best, so I'll do my best, all right? Revelation chapter 2, just a couple of verses here. And we've been talking about uh, things that can be lost. You can lose a lot of things. You cannot lose your salvation, amen. all right? Big amen there. Thank God for that. Uh, but you can lose your testimony, and, and you can lose uh, your power with God. And you can lose your fellowship with the Lord. There's, there's a, a number of things. You can lose your purity. We talked about that. All right? Uh, there are a number of things that you can lose. And it's important as, as believers that we do all we can to keep that which has been committed to us. Now, look, you committed your soul to Jesus Christ. He'll never lose it. He'll never lose it. We don't have to worry about it this way. It's really this way where things start to break down. And uh, I, I want to look at something that can be lost in your life as a believer. Revelation chapter number 2, look at verse number 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And has found them liars. They had discernment. That's a good thing. And, and notice that they, they did a lot of good stuff. They had works and they had labor and patience. And they had some things going for them as a church. Verse 3, and has born and has patience. And for my name's sake hast labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Father, this morning we ask for your help. Lord, thank you so much for the good singing this morning. And the Lord, I feel like we've already heard some good messages. It's been great. Lord, thank you for these men that finished a class and for these young people, Lord, and the time they took to bake and some of the adults that have helped bake as well. And what a, what a just a beautiful thing, how, how, how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And Lord, to see Brother Mooberry's uh, uh, burden for the people of Brazil, God, we just thank you so much for what's already happened here. And God, I, I know that beyond these walls, there are several hundred thousand people in this community that don't know Jesus as their Savior. Lord, help us be busy telling them. And God, I pray you bless the message. Lord, help us not to lose our first love. Lord, if somebody has, I pray you bring them back. Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated if you would. Now, I said this before we read the passage. That I believe this message is timely. For our church at this time of year for a reason. You say, why? Those that are, that are plugged in, those that are connected, you guys are busy. And those of you that aren't, you're busy on vacation, doing other things around your house, and busy with work, and things are, just life is busy. And, and what happens sometimes, it's not even sin, it's not even necessarily the, 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 the degradation of society, it's just life. And you get busy, and some of you are even busy for serving God. I want you to understand that any passage of Scripture has a historical, has a doctrinal, and a practical application. Historically, Ephesus was a church in Asia Minor that John writes. And John writes him and says, man, you guys got this right, and you got this right, and you got this right, and you're busy for God. And, and let me say this, I believe more than likely most Christians today are probably not busy enough for him. They're busy, but not for the Lord. 
Having said that, being busy for God by itself does not equate to you falling in love with Jesus Christ. Let me give you, that's a historical thing, right? Doctrinally, we understand that that, that first church, Ephesus, is a church that is a picture of the first church or the first period of church history. Very close to the time of Jesus Christ, and they were dedicated, and they were committed, and they had seen a lot of things in their city. That was where Apollos got straightened out on his doctrine. That's where the seven sons of Sceva had the demons jump on them, the devils jump on them, uh, because they couldn't cast them out. Uh, Ephesus is where they burned those books that were uh, committed to witchcraft. There was a lot of things that happened in Ephesus, so when they got saved, man, they got saved. And they were committed, and they were all the way in. And they were busy for God. But they lost something along the way. Many a Christian is busy and busy for the Lord and busy serving God. But that love and that passion and that desire to talk about Jesus and sing about Jesus and think about Jesus and tell others about Him, it's gone. Well, I'm busy. I'm just so busy. I'm, I'm busy in church, and I'm busy doing this, and I'm busy doing that. Great, wonderful, and I'm serving God. You might be busy, but have you ever noticed, have you ever gone to a restaurant, <laughs> and you watch, you know, you watch a, a couple, and they're like this, and they're holding hands across, and, and they, just, they just keep talking about nothing. <laughs> she's trying not to look at me because she's turning red. And boy, they just, they are into it. You know, and you look at them and you go, they ain't married. <laughs> Come on, am I right? Or, or, or they just got married. You know, I remember when we first got, I mean, I mean, our, our honeymoon trip, it was just like, I just, I was just so happy. I get to be with her and she gets to be with me and I don't need a chaperone. We can hold hands and we can kiss and we can do whatever we want because we're married now. Man, I just, that was great. And listen, when you first get saved, you're just so enthralled with what Jesus did for you and who Jesus is. And it doesn't bother you that the coffee wasn't tasting right at church. It doesn't bother you that it was too cold or the preacher went too long or someone said the wrong thing about your outfit or whatever else might go wrong in a church. All that you cared about was, man, I can't wait to hear more about him. I can't wait to talk about him again. I can't wait to get around his people. And as time goes on, what happens? It just sort of. You ever watch other couples at a restaurant? (sighs) What are you going to order? Okay. And they're just sort of, or they're doing this. And I've watched them. Sometimes I want to grab them and go, look at each other. <laughs> and they're just doing this number. And then the waitress comes, or the server comes by, hi, hi. And it's like, you, you, you weren't doing that a second ago. There's also a live human being sitting across from you. Well, I already know everything about her. Yeah, I know everything about him, too, and it ain't beautiful. And you don't know, man, I'm married. And I think to myself, well, you married him, sister. But you understand what I'm talking about. You go into a restaurant, you go, you know, they've been married a while. They're sitting on their phones, and they don't even know the other person's there. And when they first got married, that is not how that started. Or they wouldn't have been there to begin with. You say, what happened? Uh, some of you may know the story. Some of you may know the illustration, but I'll give it to you again. The old story about, and this is why I bought an old truck. I had a neighbor of mine that had this old rusty bucket truck. It's a, a 1974 uh, Chevy C10, I believe it is. And boy, it's a beauty. It's, be- it's going to be a beauty someday. You say, you're going to restore it? Yeah, when I get kids married and, you know, they're not eating all the food anymore and they're not breaking bones and teeth and whatever else can go wrong with them and all that stuff. When they're gone, I might restore that truck. I do love you. I just want you to know that, okay? <laughs> uh, but, man, I look, you know, I got that truck and it's got one bench. You know, the old trucks just have a bench. Man, that... I want to I someday drive around and just take her for a ride. <laughs> you know? Ever heard about the old farmer? Him and his wife are driving down the road, and he's just sitting there driving quietly. You know, like old couples do, just not talking, just doing their own world, you know? And 
he's driving, and she's sitting over here, and she's looking out the window. <laughs> you know, honey, I just feel like we're not as close as we used to be. And he didn't even look at her. He just keeps driving. I ain't moved, honey. <laughs> True story. Can I say this? If you don't feel like you're as close to the Lord as you used to be, he ain't moved. Oftentimes, there's this, there's this preoccupation with, well, I used to, to do this, and I used to do that, and I, I used to be real close to the Lord, and I, I used to get excited about the Bible, and I used to get excited about church, and I, I, it was all that I thought about, and, and okay, well, quit living in the past and go, okay, how do I get back there? The early church of Ephesus, look, they understood that Jesus loved them, and they understood that he had washed away their sins, and now they were busy serving. And they were busy getting rid of the false apostles and the, the false preachers. And they're busy making sure that the church can rightly divide the Bible. And they're teaching the Bible. And they're busy, but they forgot what it was they were even busy about. The Bible describes for us that God is love. Nobody can describe true love in this world without describing sacrifice. Every woman dreams of a man that will, you know, be willing to lay down his life for her or maybe not turn the air conditioning on for her, you know, or maybe change the football game for something else like Hallmark or whatever else it might be. Every woman dreams of that man who will lay down his life, and you've got that in Jesus Christ. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that God first loved us. Man, you, you entered into this relationship with Jesus Christ based on the fact that he loved you enough to lay down his life for you. And at first, it's like, man, he could do no wrong. He's so wonderful. And as time goes on, and that familiarity with the things of God, and the familiarity with church, and, oh, I've read this in my Bible before. Some of you, when I tur said re turn Revelation 2, you're like, yep, I know where he's going. I've already checked out. Hey, listen, if that's where you're at, what I'm telling you now is you've lost your first love. Remember when you first came to church and you were just happy being a Bible leaving church? And after a while, it's like, ah, oh, here comes Sister So and so. <laughs> and everyone right now is thinking, I know who that is. Yes, yeah, probably you. Quit thinking of someone else. <laughs> you know, and oh man, that guy never shuts up, you know. And you know, at first you didn't even see any of that. You just you just were like, man, they actually opened the Bible here? And we look at verses. And we learned that that was Old Testament, that was New. Man, this is great. And man, I, I, and then the, the, the Spirit of God started to convict you and deal with your heart. You're going, man, this is wonderful. I love this place. And, then, and you like couldn't wait. I mean, I've watched people come into a, a rock concert or whatever else. They're there 30 minutes only before the doors open. They want to get their seat, you know, and they want to make sure it's the front row, you know. And, and a lot of churches today, it's like, man, how fast can I get to the back? And how can I make sure nobody notices I'm here and zip out as soon as it's done? Now, look, I'm not picking on you if you don't know anybody here. I understand it takes time to get to know people. But understand what I'm saying is this. There was a time and a place in your life where you wanted to get as much of God as you could. And as time goes by, it just sort of, yeah, well, made the church again. Get my Bible in the morning and I got my two chapters. Okay, there's my chapters. I'm done. Can I give you some signs you maybe you've lost your first love? There's a lack of communication. They say that money and communication are the two leading causes of divorce in North America. And I would say this, money and communication are probably the two leading causes of people that start, they're the two, uh, 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 I would say, leading signs of people walking away from the Lord and falling out of love with Jesus Christ. You say, what quit? So I quit giving, and I quit talking to him, and I quit caring that he's even talking or not talking to me. You can look at a marriage and go, okay, what's the trouble? I can't tell you how many times people come to me and go, yeah, Pastor, here's what's going on, and I'm sorry. I used to go, okay, let me put on my theological seminary hat, and I remember everything that they taught me. And let me lay hands on one of the, you know, the great theologians' books, and through osmosis, I'll know exactly what to tell them. And I used to think of all these deep things. Here's where I start now. When anybody brings me a problem, are you reading your Bible? Are, are, you, are, you in prayer? are you enjoying your fellowship and your time with God? Well, I do it. Okay, I didn't ask you that. 
There are times when the kids do it because they're told to, but they don't do it. You understand what I'm saying? What I'm, what I'm getting at is this. I'm getting at, look, you can check all the boxes and say, I went to church. I passed out a track. Hey, look, uh, I, we had a slide up here about giving out tracks. We were saying a track a day in May. Now it's, uh, help me out here, is too soon to end in June. Bam. There you go. I'm trying to get things stuck in your head, using whatever I can. Get the gospel out. But you might go, there's my track for the day. Read my Bible for the day. Went to church this week. If I don't, pastor will text me and go, where you been? Miss you. Check. Hey, by the way, do you, know, do you understand what a good shepherd does when the sheep's not there? He cares about them. I, I promise you, folks, if you learn anything about me, you'll find out real quick. I have zero desire to control any aspects of your life because I have a hard enough time with mine. But I do care about you. And I, and I did this check, and I, I, you know, I went through the list of things I have to pray for. Pray for brother so-and-so. Uh, pray for this sister. Okay, check, check, check. And I'm done. I'm done with my duties. Okay, I can move on with my day. Oh, remember when you just couldn't get enough Bible? Remember when you just wanted to hear more preaching? Remember when you heard, man, we have this evangelist coming into town, and he's going to be here for three, three nights. I get to be in church in a row, and now it's like, Man, I'm going to get the kids up in the morning, and, and i got to get the dog to the vet. And, I mean, if I miss one night, is it really that big of a deal? And, I mean, is it really? It wasn't always that way. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm just, I'm going to keep it PG. Don't worry, we have kids in here. But on the drive away from our wedding, it was like, <laughs> hi, hi, hi. I get to put my hand on your leg. Hey, you know. <laughs> Just excited because, you know, we're married now. And, and remember what it was like, that liberty you had in Christ when you first got saved. You first found some truth in the Word of God. The church of Ephesus. Look, I want you to notice here. Look in, uh, oh, verse number uh, 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. You say, oh, they have all these things going for them. But you say, what's going on? They're not communicating with the Lord like they used to. How about a lack of common interests? Hey, let me tell you something. As your marriage develops... There should be more things you share in common. I know that's a profound thought, but that's how it's supposed to be. In your walk with Jesus Christ, after 10, 20, 30 years, there should be some things that you get excited about because he gets excited about them. I mean, look, look you saw, I, I've seen it before a million times. A Bronco score, woo, touchdown! You know, Brother Matt, go. Someone got saved. Well, that's good. <laughs> you know what your problem is? You're out of love with Jesus Christ. Funny, isn't it? Funny how a $10 bill looks so big when you take it to church. So small when you take it to Walmart. Funny how long it takes to serve God for an hour, but how quickly a team plays for 60 minutes. Funny how long a couple of hours you spend at church feel, but... How short they are when you're watching a movie. <coughs> Avengers, three hours. <laughs> Funny how we can't think of anything to say when we pray. But have zero difficulty pouring out your heart to people online who don't even know anything about you. Funny how people want to get a front row seat at any game or concert, but scramble to get a back seat at church. Funny how we need two or three weeks advance to no notice to fit a church event into our schedule but can adjust our schedule. Hey, I got free tickets. To, okay, I'm there. Hey, brother, I've been announcing this thing for church for six months. Oh, preacher, it just slit my mind and my calendar and the bulletin and the 50,000 times I just right over. Let me tell you something. You say, what's the problem? Lack of interest. Funny how much difficulty some people have learning a simple gospel verse well enough to tell others, but how simple it is for same people to understand and repeat gospel about somebody else. Funny how we believe what the media says, but we question what God says. It's funny, isn't it? Some of the signs are a lack of communication, a lack of common interest, a lack of caring about the other party. You know, when you get married, there's somebody else that's there. That's a profound thought. <laughs> right? 
I bought a truck. I bought a 2014 truck a couple years ago, and I bought this truck. And one of the things I looked for was this. You're going to laugh at me. That's fine. I looked for controls that would allow her to get it as hot as she wanted <laughs> and me as cool as I wanted. You got my side, and you have yours. You say you're selfish. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what I've learned? I've learned this. There are times, listen, guys, I'm not going to, this is God honest truth. For years, I fell asleep with a fan in the window. In Fountain, Colorado, Christina, Christina, Sister Christina knows where that is. And when I grew up in Fountain, I had a window, and I had a, a, a fan in that window. And every night, I had that fan blowing. It could be 30 degrees. It might be 50 degrees. That fan was blowing. And, man, I loved the fan on when I went to sleep. I don't get the fan anymore. <laughs> right? Oh. You say, why? Because there's somebody else in that room. Can't sleep with the fan on. I'm thinking it's a beautiful sound. <laughs> you can't sleep with it on. So we say, what do you do? Well, you learn to let go of the fan. Now, I know that's a funny illustration, but are there not some things in, that, in your life like that for Jesus Christ? There's a lack of commitment. If I walked around like this, every time I went in public, I said, let me just take this off. Right now, her blood's already boiling. And this is an illustration. I take the wedding ring off because I just, you know, I mean, you never know. You might run into someone else. And some of you are like, where is this going? <laughs> you say, what is this ring a sign of? It's a sign of commitment. Can I say this? You ought to be committed to Jesus Christ. Amen. That means there's some things that you won't probably partake in because I, I love him. There may be some things you go, let me rearrange my schedule because this is important. It's not that this isn't important, but he's first. Well, I mean, someone else will do it. Okay, but you'll miss out on it. If that's what God wants you to get in on, then you're missing out. You see, what did you see? A lack of commitment. Reading a story with Emma as she's finishing up school. As soon as I mention her name, she goes up. Pray for my kids. <laughs> reading a story called Two Hands, Two Hands. And it's a story that takes place in Ethiopia. And there's a man named Geber and a man named Onisa. And one day a peddler comes to town. A peddler gets up and he goes, everybody listen around. Like the old time medicine, you know, uh, guys come around and sell you, you know, snake oil or whatever else. Everybody gather around and, and he gets them all around. He goes, let me tell you about a white man. And this white man's name is Jesus. And Jesus will take you and he will take you and he will flip you inside out and he will turn you and twist you and, and he will make you new. And Gebra was a slave. He looked down at his hands. And Onisa was a witch doctor and he had matted, thick, greasy hair with cow's dung in it. You say, what for? To try to appease the unclean spirits. And his nails were this long, and he was just filthy. He hadn't, hadn't bathed in two years. Why? To try to gain more, enough power to overcome the unclean spirits, and he never could. And this peddler goes on to talk about this Jesus guy, and then all of a sudden he goes, okay, now buy my clothes. And that was it. There's no altar call. There's no scripture. It's just here's this story about Jesus. And so they, they hear this guy, this Jesus man is in Gofu province. And so they walk for days, and they, they finally get to this place where they see a white man. They've been asking all the towns, is there a white man here? Is there a white man here? Is there a white man here? And finally someone says, over there you can find a white man. And so they finally get to this house and they see this man named Mr. McClellan, a missionary. And he's working on his house uh, because a storm had just come past. And they said, Mr., Mr., Sir, Sir, are you Jesus? Without trying to laugh in front of them, he's laughing on the inside going, brother, I ain't Jesus. And he said this, I, I'm not Jesus but I can introduce you to him. They said, well, is he a white man? And he says, not exactly, no. <laughs> He's a Jew. <laughs> and he goes on, tell them this, and for, for, for days they just sit and they listen. And they listen, and they listen, and they listen. And finally, they get to a place where they go, I want Jesus. And with this hand, I renounce Satan. And with this hand, I embrace Jesus. 
And all of a sudden, when he looks down, his clothes are filthy, and he hasn't showered in years. And no one told him anything. It's just the Spirit of God. And he, he looks at himself and goes, I want to be clean. And he takes a bath, and he gets clean. And they leave that town, and they go back to their village. And on every single village that they pass, they're going and going, we need to tell you about a man named Jesus. He can take you, and he can make you new, and he can take the unclean spirits away, and he can take the chains off spiritually, and you don't have to be a slave to sin. And they go through every single village. They can't stop talking about Jesus wherever they go. Why? Because they love the man that loved them enough to die for him. No one had to tell him. There was no discipleship class. There was nothing. It was just, he did this for me. I want the world to know. You know what they were doing that day? They were showing off for the other one. Some of you young ladies, someday, pray that they find a good young man that loves Jesus Christ. I can tell you this. When that engagement ring comes on, it's going to be all about showing off the bling. (laughs) You know, you go to a grocery store and you pull out your credit card. (laughs) Right? You want everyone to know. When's the last time someone could say, man, what is the deal with that guy? Who won't stop talking about this Jesus Christ guy? Brother Matt says something profound. Get a hold of this. The lost heathen are no longer just in third world countries. They're your neighbors who have no clue who Jesus Christ is. It would do the city of Aurora good to have people who would not shut up about Jesus Christ. And as you go out from this place, you go, let me tell you about this man named Jesus. Let me tell you about, you say, man, what is that person's problem? Well, they're committed. We know that much. Got to hurry. The method of losing your first love, routine and responsibilities. You first get married, you can't stop talking about each other, can't stop talking to each other, then all of a sudden this human larva enters the picture. (laughs) And for the next 18 to 25 or 30 years of your life, depending on your parenting skills, you will be all about (laughs) that child. And if you're not careful, what ends up happening is you got to go to the soccer game, got to go this, got to go here, got to go here. And before you know it, you're not talking. Here's what happens. You get saved. You come in. You learn the word of God. And you go, okay, I want to get busy for God. And before you know it, you got this and you got this and you got this. And you're so overwhelmed with the things you have to do for God that you're not even communicating. How about misplaced priorities? Isn't it interesting how the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God? That you love the Lord your God first and him only shalt thou serve. And you love him first and then people after that. We get that backwards sometimes. It's interesting how God puts these things and he goes, okay, this is first. I'm first here. I'm first here. I'm first here. And you go, yeah, 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 I get that. And after a while, you can see whether or not that really is belief by where you put your time and where you put your money and where you put your schedule and where you put your desires. And then there's what I call the squirrel travesty. For a while, it's all about the Lord, and then after a while, it's like, oh, look at that new thing. Oh, this new hobby, and this new job, and this new, new, and just, it's all about this new stuff, and before you know it, that has more appeal to you than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Can I show you the repercussions of leaving your first love? I want you to notice in verse number five, you forget what it was like. Notice what he says in verse number five, remember. Why? Because you're forgetting. Remember. One of the repercussions is forgetting, and I, 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 I remember hearing a story about a young lady, and there was another book that Emma was reading about uh, being stuck in Holland while her, uh, during the time of War II before the Nazis invaded, and they invade, and she's an American citizen, and she can't get out, and after a few years went by living with grandparents, the thing that she was scared of the most was forgetting what her father's face looked like. And as soon as he came and he wrapped his arms around her years later, she said, man, I can't believe that I was, I was afraid of forgetting. As soon as I saw you, I knew exactly who you were. I would say this, we forget what his face looks like. Notice in verse 5, the Lord says this, I'll come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Boy, I'll tell you what, one of the worst things in the world to do is go visit a church where it's Ichabod. The glory is departed, and there's nothing going on. And that can be a church of 20 or 2,000. It ain't about the numbers. It's about what God is doing or not doing in that place. 
When God takes a church's candlestick, that's his way of saying, all right, you're on your own. You've not been needing me for a while anyways. Fix it yourself. And boy, that is not a good place to be in. You miss out in the presence of the Lord. Isn't it funny how God bypassed Eli and went to Samuel? And how when God showed up, the Bible says about Samson, he wished not that the Lord was there. One of the worst things in the world is to go to a place. <laughs> you ever been there, Christian? You don't have to raise your hand, but just think about it. Preachers ask a lot of rhetorical questions. That means don't raise your hand. <laughs> like, you know, how many of you men can say you've never looked at a woman lust after in your heart? Do not raise hands. Don't do any of that. So just, sit, just sit there and be just, okay, yes, I'm listening. How many times have you been to church service and you're sitting next to somebody and you're like, dude, are we in the same service? Man, you're excited and you're getting something out of this. And I'm like, what is this done? When is this done? I wish not the Lord was there. Can I say this? Your first love can be restored. Look at verse number five. We'll be done. He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. You know, it's really simple. It's not as hard as you make it. Go back to where you left Jesus. Notice what he says. Remember from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Go back and pick it up where you left it. Oftentimes people will come and say, well, you just don't know. It's so complicated. And this happened, that happened. I'm not saying it won't be hard, but I'm going to say this. It'll be worth getting back to where you left him. If a, marriage, if a married couple says, we're just struggling, okay, one of the things that I do but after we go through, what's your fellowship with the Lord like? After we get through that, you know what's going to be? Okay, why'd you fall in love with each other? And you start listing the things out, and, you, and then you look up for a moment. It's almost like, oh, yeah. He was handsome, you know? And, and, and she was, you know, she was sweet, and he was thoughtful. And, and you look up, and you go, man, I, I think that person's still there. I just haven't been looking at him. My eyes have been somewhere else. When you get out of fellowship with Jesus Christ, you want to get back to what you do? You just look at him for a little bit. Because the Bible says he's altogether lovely. Thou hast left thy first love. Boy, they had a lot of stuff going for him. But they lost the most important thing. There's a matter of repenting. There's a matter of renewing. Now, I don't want to get into a long thing on repentance. Let me just say this. It's a changing of mind. People that teach repentance means you dropped every bad habit are foolish because the Bible doesn't teach that. No one would repent if that's what it meant. But it is a changing of your heart. God himself repents. God has no sin to repent of. Are you with me? He has no bad habits to leave, but he changed his mind because of Moses' influence. You know, if you were struggling in your marriage, I say, hey, maybe just go for a drive. Maybe just get away for a weekend and just spend some time together. You know, I'd say to you, if you're struggling, if you've realized, maybe you need to realize you're not where you think you are. And that taste that used to just, man, just a little taste, and I'm so excited for it. Now it's like, eh, I'm here. If that's where you're at, can I say this? Come back. Well, Pastor, we're busy. We got a lot of things going on. I understand. I understand busy. And I can tell you, there is many a preacher who used to stand behind a pulpit just like this, is way out in left field. And they were busy for God. And they got caught up in all kinds of filthy stuff. You say, well, how does that happen? It happens because you've got all the stuff in the right order according to everybody else's eyes. But you've fallen out of love with Jesus Christ. I would say repent, I would say renew, I would say reinvest your time and efforts and talents. Where's your heart at today, Christian? Can I say this? I've used this illustration before. I want a young man. I will take Leonard Jr. Come on up, buddy. Yeah. That's a good way to keep everybody paying attention, isn't it? <laughs> Every Sunday, we're going we're gonna to do All right, come on up. All right. No, I'm just kidding. That's not how this is going to Stand right there. Stand right there. Go back. Okay. Now, every time I take a step, I want you to take one towards me as well, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it getting awkward yet? <laughs> He's like, I ain't going any further than that. 
You know the Bible says, thanks buddy, you know the Bible says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Have you fallen out of love with Jesus Christ? That's all I'll say. That's all I'll say.